Well, you guys have a great treat this morning. We've got Pastor Timothy Brock in the house. Man. You men that came to the men's retreat, wasn't it awesome? Amen. I also want to say publicly to those men that were unable to come this year, uh, we missed you, we loved you, uh, and I want you to look at already, we're going to have our next men's advance at the end of March, start planning now, we're going to get back on the March rotation because the camp's going to be back open to us, so please plan for that so that you can come with us in March, we missed you, we love you, um, and uh, come to the one in March. Anyway. A couple years ago, Crystal and I were down in Alamogordo, New Mexico for a wedding. I always go to church whenever we're out of town. And so when we're out of town, uh, I always spend a lot of time going through websites. Even before I show up, I listen to sermons because I don't have time to waste on a Sunday for someone that can't preach good and doesn't love Jesus. And so we spent a lot of time researching out. I was like, dude, I like this guy. He's my kind of people. Uh, and so we went to his church, uh, Christ Community Church, Alamogordo, New Mexico, and uh, we were just so excited about what God was doing at his church. And then after service, I, I tackled him, full body tackle, and I was like, we're going to be friends. <laughs> We're going to be buddies. We're going to be pals. And, and uh, I don't think he really understood what, what that meant when I said that. But, uh, yeah, John actually preached that Sunday. It was, it was really good preaching. But uh, I was just like, I told Tim, I was like, hey, man, we're going to be friends. We're going to be buddies. And uh, he's kind of a, on the edge of millennials. And so he loves to text. And, but he hates to talk on the phone. I'll literally call him, and then he'll text me back and be like, bro, what's up? I'm like, let's talk. Let's talk on the phone. <laughs> He's like, why? We could be friends without talking on the phone, but every once in a while we get to talk on the phone. But when we get together, there's, a, there's really a spirit of brotherhood that comes between us because we both love Jesus. Uh, we both love our lives and our wives and our kids and our ministries. And so uh, he's had me, as you guys know, to co go down there and preach for him a couple times. And so we were like, you know what, man, you got to get you up here, uh, preach to all of our men, and then have you guys experience him as well. Amen. And so today, I just want you guys to give him a big faith and victory welcome and receive what God has for you through Pastor Timothy Brock. Amen. Love you, brother. Love you too, bro. Yeah, he's a big guy. Whoa, hot mic. Can I move this, John? When you're uh, vertically challenged, I don't want to limit anybody's ability to see me anyway, so <laughs> good to see you guys here. Yeah, Matt said it all really well. I'm going to get to the introduction on uh, Matt in a minute, uh, but I want you guys to know that it's a, such a joy and a privilege to be with you here at Faith and Victory Church in a state I had never even been to previously uh, until Wednesday. Yeah. I am a millennial. I'm not on the edge of being a millennial. I am a millennial. I don't know why that's funny. <laughs> so when Matt first preached at our church, he started by saying, I'm the kind of pastor that wants you guys to, to interact with me. And then he quickly said, it's going to be a long morning. So point is, I'm, I'm actually kind of used to people just kind of sitting there smiling at me or sleeping. Uh, you guys <laughs> evidently are very vocal. So... <laughs> That's cool. It was an absolutely incredible three days um, with our men. Where's my men at that were at the advance? Man, lives were changed. I mean that. Um, faith was deepened. Spiritual victories were won. And most of all, Jesus Christ was exalted. That's what we set out to do. We wanted to behold our God. And we did. And our lives were transformed. I want to thank the men of uh, FVC for your passion for your love for God, for your love for me and for each other. Listen, I just kept thinking about it. To give up your weekend, to, to listen to some five foot six guy you've never even met before talk about Jesus tells me that your sign over here is true, that you guys are all about or all about that Jesus life. You really are. And I told Matt, I was like, so are we, we kind of expecting lower numbers on Sunday because they've been at church for the last three days? He's like, oh no. Like, it's going to be like, everyone's going to be there. I'm like, he wasn't lying. He was right. Brother Paul, there's, there's that. I need you. I need you like right here, bro. <laughs> oh, man. But my life was changed as well. And a lot of it had to do with the fact of you guys just showing love to one another. John and I kept talking about that. We're like, dude, that's, it's so awesome. They, they hug. They were, you guys smelled terrible. And yet... <laughs> Three days of not showering. I don't care who you are. You're going to smell funny. 
and yet the love never waned in that at all. I just was so moved by that. I do want to thank Pastor Matt and Crystal, your entire pastoral staff, um, for trusting me to fill the pulpit as a senior pastor myself. I know that uh, you don't just ask anybody. To, to preach to, to your flock, to your people that God has entrusted you with, spiritual oversight over. So it's truly an honor. It's something I take very seriously. Don't take lightly in any capacity. Um, and, and over the years, Pastor Matt has become a, a hero of the faith for me and to me. Uh, I think the fact of the matter is a little inside baseball, not that you guys care about the life of a senior pastor, but it can be very lonely. It can be kind of a weird dynamic where you start feeling the more you're in it, uh, the less people can really relate to you and really know you. And so um, it's hard to have kind of genuine friendships after a while. You always feel like they want something from you. Um, so to have a friend who gets it, who doesn't really need or want anything from me other than just to occasionally for me to pick up the phone when you call. <laughs> I'm working on that. I think you were in the middle of a funeral once. You're like, hey, I'm in the middle of a funeral, but you called, so it has to be important. I was like, no, it's, call me back. It's fine. But the point is to have a pastor who can sympathize, spiritualize, strategize. Man, it's been a blessing, a blessing in my life. Plus, Pastor Matt, as he kind of alluded to, he's got this incredible way of making stalking attractive. <laughs> Seriously. He, you guys know what I'm talking about by that reaction. He already told the story. I told John, I was like, I'm going to say the t tell the same story. But yeah, after he came to our church the first time, he's like, hey, man, you know, this really impressively tall guy hugged me. I'm like in his navel. I'm like, Ugh. It's not, that's why I made him stand down. <clears throat> and I didn't know him. You know, he, he had stalked me at this point. I hadn't stalked him. I had no idea who he was. And he's like, we are going to be great friends. And I was like, where are you from? He's like, Seattle, Washington area. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is sweet. Love your passion, but I'll probably never hear from you, see, see you again in my life. This will probably be the first and the last time. I literally had that internal conversation with myself. I'm like, just be nice to this guy. He'll leave. <laughs> this is a place I can be honest, I guess. That's good. But your loving persistence beat my uh, reluctant resistance, and I'm so glad it did. Um, so I can honestly say I love your pastor. I love your family. I've come to love your staff, your men. Now I love all of you because you know what? We all love the Lord. We belong to the family of God. Let's give our God praise this morning. It's about him. <laughs> Let me very quickly introduce myself in the terms of uh, you know, my life just a little bit. That's not why you're here, but I want you to know who you're, who you're listening to for the next 30 minutes. Uh, again, my name is Tim Brock. I got a beautiful wife. Her name is Leanne. She's a 14-year master degree, 10-year teacher, um, teaches second grade. She also runs our children's department of 250 kids and 70 to 80 volunteers every month. She's, a, she's incredible. Um, we've got three children. Uh, Sadie Jane is 11. Dempsey Drew is five. Finley Jameson is two. And around Thanksgiving, we'll welcome our fourth and final child child into the world. Um, Bre Brecklin Renee is going to be her name. And so we're so blessed. I pastor a church called Christ Community Church. You can find us on Facebook. I told Matt, I said, I had about 20 guys send me a friend request yesterday on Facebook. <laughs> Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Makes me feel good. All right. How many of you would agree, though, on a very spiritual level that these, these last 12 to 18 months have been uniquely challenging politically, physically, at times emotionally, certain, certainly spiritually. But what, what I'm believing for is that these fiery trials are going to produce in the people of God um, a renewed passion, a refueled faith to be who God has called us to be, to do what God has called us to do. At the closing of the men's advance yesterday, Pastor Matt had us all circled up and he told us, I want you guys to close your eyes and I want you uh, to let God tell you what he, want, he wants you to take away from this time together. And, you know, I thought about it from a personal level and the things that I need to give up, the things I need to change, the, the areas of my life I need to surrender or resurrender. And then I started thinking about it as a pastor, as a spiritual leader. And, and what I'm asking and believing God for is new mercies. I know that seems cliche, but it's important. For new blessings, for a new and fresh anointing, not only for me and the church I pastor down in southern New Mexico, but for all of you, for Faith and Victory Church, a fresh anointing. Yes a new blessing of God to pour down upon you. But in order to do that, church, I believe that we need to know or at least be reminded of why we're here in the first place. 
In other words, I think we need to be reminded of our God-given purpose. Not what some guy wrote and you can pick up at Barnes & Noble. I'm talking about what God and his word has said is the purpose for our existence. Because whenever we think about the purpose of life, especially when we're young, we got some young people over here. Can I hear from the young people? Hey, okay, I love it. Young at heart. Um, but when we're young, you know, especially like junior high, high school, you know, we can usually boil down the purpose of life to three basic things that we've either seen or been told growing up. And those three basic things, tell me if this sounds right, is education, career, and family. That's the drumbeat of our life. That's kind of the go-to reoccurring message that we hear. We hear people say to us, you need to get an education, you need to go to college, you need to get a job so you can have a career, so you can eventually have a family, live it at the end of a cul-de-sac, drive a minivan, and get a 40, uh, an 80-inch 4K TV that you can sit in front of until the day you die. In other words, the reality since junior high, or somewhere in that area, is is if we could put life into a metaphor, life has been like this train ride that we're on. And every year, it just keep, seems to get faster and faster and faster. It's just full speed ahead because, again, I've got to graduate high school so I can go to college, so I can get a job, so I can raise a family, so I can live in a cul-de-sac, so I can drive a minivan, so I can retire, so I can excel, succeed, and win at this game called life. Yet the reality is so many people eventually start to relate to the great philosopher and poet Henry David Thoreau, who once said that most men, he said the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And then there was William Wallace who in Braveheart, anybody brave enough to say they watched an R-rated movie at one point in your life? You're that kind of church. <laughs> I'm glad the teenagers kept their hand down. Bless you. <laughs> but in that great movie of the 90s, that uh, cultural defining movie that won all sorts of awards, there's this great scene where William Wallace stood before his warriors, his Scottish team, who in this moment of the movie had been fighting for years. They had been in the middle of battle for years. They find themselves in this scene being honest with themselves that they're full of fear. They're, they're really weary from the battle. They're ready to quit. They're ready to go home. They're ready to throw in the towel. In other words, the battle cry of these men was self-preservation, was safety and comfort. And so they're all lined up in battle and they're kind of saying to their leader with their shoulders down, they're like, hey, we want to leave. We want to run that we may live. We want to go home. They said, for the English are too many. It's too many of them. It's a terrible Scottish accent. <laughs> And so William Wallace, you're familiar with this moment. He gives them that rousing speech. And again, I apologize for this New Mexican trying to give a Scottish accent, but I think it helps. William Wallace on the back of his horse with his long flowing hair and his face painted half blue and, and half nothing on the other side. <laughs> he starts going back and forth on the battle lines. And he says, fight and you may die. Run and you may live at least for a little while. He says, but dying in your beds many years from now, would you trade all of the days from this day to that for one chance? Remember that moment? Yeah. For one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives. You know where this is going. Yeah. But they will never take, say it with me, off freedom. Yeah. That's right. So what was he doing in that moment? What was William Wallace doing? He was giving his men, his people, a cause. He was giving them a purpose. And then he summarized that great epic speech by saying, every man dies, but only a few men really live. Let me say that one more time. Every man dies, but only a few men really live. And I remember watching that in high school. I was about 17 years old, a senior in high school. And I remember watching that. That was back in the days of DVDs. You'd go back to the previous chapter, watch it again. And I was like, man, this fires me up. I too want meaning. I want purpose in my life. I want to fight for a cause. I want to live for something greater than myself. But then it wasn't about 10 years later in my mid twenties that I experienced what I called a quarter life crisis. I'd been through university. I kind of had some things go right, some things go wrong in my life. I was starting to feel confused and dazed and wondering what, what it was all about. 
and I happened to stumble in, into my dad's office. I thought it was just a, a, an odd coincidence. But at that time, I was looking around thinking, man, everything I'm chasing and everything I'm pursuing isn't satisfying my heart. And I just kept thinking, I don't, I don't want this. I don't want to live and then die in this nothingness. And so in this season of, of kind of doom and gloom and sadness and despondency, again, I found myself in my dad's office. And what you have to understand about my dad is um, he's since gone to be with the Lord, but he was a, a great man of faith. He loved God. He was an alpha male. He was a leader among leaders. He was a preacher of God's word for decades. And, and so he was somebody that I could talk to in these moments. I really didn't have a point of going to see him. I just kind of stumbled into his office and I sat down and, and, and he just knew. He knew his boy. How many of you dads know your kids? kids. You know, he knew me. He knew what I was, he was, I was going through something. And he said, what's wrong, son? And I said, well, I don't know that. I, I just don't know what I want from life. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I don't really know what I should be pursuing. And I remember my dad said to me, he said, son, you've got to start building your life on something. And he said, and I would recommend that you don't build it on something that you've just made up. He said, build your life, your ministry, your future on a biblical truth and then build out your principles, your pursuits and your passions on and around that biblical precept. He was like, don't just do stuff. All you're doing, son, is stuff. He said, find out why God put you here and then walk in that. <laughs> and after that impromptu meeting, I like to call it a divine appointment. I took it seriously. And I began to ask and pray and deeply consider, God, why am I here? What am I here to do? God, what is the reason for my purpose and my existence? And like my dad said, if I'm being honest, I didn't want to just make something up. I didn't want some cool sounding, tweetable, repeatable, quotable line, but incorrect answer. Because listen, I've been to so many funerals. I was telling the guys this yesterday, that one of the hardest parts of being a pastor is having to deal with death and tragedy and doing funerals. It's hard. But I've heard too many people get up and eulogize the dead at funerals, and they just come up with these, to me, insane explanations for why these people's lives had meaning. And I didn't want that. I wanted the answer. I wanted the rock-solid foundational answer. I wanted the reason why. I wanted to know what the old theologians meant by the chief end of man. I wanted the reason behind all reasons. What are we doing here? Why is all of this here? What does this mean for how I'm to live out my days? And what I found is that God gives us the answer in his word. Amen. And so for the rest of our time together, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read a bunch of Bible verses to you to help you see and to answer this question. What is your chief end? Yes. What does the Bible say? What does God say about why you are here? In other words, what's the purpose behind your purpose? So let's start with the big stuff. Why the heavens? Why the earth? Psalms 19 says that they exist for this reason, to display the glory of God. It says specifically, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. How about this church? Why are you here? Isaiah 43 says, I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created. Why? For my glory. In other words, what the word of God is saying to you this morning is that you are made by God and for the glory of God. You go, Pastor Tim, what does that even mean for the glory of God? You're asking good questions this morning. What it means is the word glory in the Hebrew language, it's tied directly to the word heavy or the word weighty. It carries the idea of something having substance and value. And so when the Bible talks about the glory of God, it's talking about his personal excellence, his attributes, his holiness, his love, his beauty, his preeminence. That these attributes of God are substantial. They're not flighty and light and weak and, and flimsy. They have substance. They have, they have depth. They have weight. There's gravitas. I love that word. There's power in the name of God. And then glory in the Bible is not just the internal substance. It's, get this, it's the emanation of it. The glory of God is the revealing of who God is. It's, not, it's that which shines out, as the Bible says, as we taste and as we see that the Lord is good. Amen. And that's why the Bible speaks to the fact that the reason that all of this, all of creation is here is so the attributes of God could be on display. Yes. 
the reason your weather and your topography and, and, and your skyline is different than the skyline that we have in southern New Mexico, it's all to show the variety of the master that is God, the creator that is God. The reason that you're here and that I'm here is so God's attributes can be displayed in us. It takes all types, different heights, amen? Amen. <laughs> Different skin tones, body types, personalities, IQs, gifts, gifts, talents. It takes all of us. And all of it is so God can be on display and so that his glory can be revealed and praised by us. In other words, the glory of God is what drives everything that God has done throughout history. What about the Exodus? We started in Genesis with creation. Let's go to Exodus. Why the Exodus? Why did God deliver the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt? That's a big theme in the Old Testament. It's the, the theme in the book of Exodus. Why did it happen the way that it happened? Psalms 106 says, Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not understand your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Yet he, God, saved them. But why? For his namesake, for his namesake, that he might make known his mighty power. And then in Exodus 7, 5, God says, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. In other words, God said, I'm going to deliver them, not because of what they did, not because of what they brought to the table, but to bring glory to my name and to show my power. Then in Exodus 9.15, God said to Egypt, he says, For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence. And you would have been, I love this, cut off from the earth. But for this purpose, I have raised you up. Here's why. Why did God make Egypt this powerful nation? Here's why. To show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. I mean, think about that. Have you ever wondered why the ten plagues? I mean, think about it. I mean, we, I know we've learned about it since we were kids and we just kind of accept it. But was God just having fun? Was he just bored? He's like, you know what? I just kind of want to try some things. Let me throw some gnats on the Egyptians. Let's see how they squirm. You know what? Let's do some frogs. You know, let's see how they react to that. Like, is that what God did? Why are the 10 plagues? God just told us. I could have simply put out my hand and just gone, and they were gone. It would have been easy. Like, Easy peasy for sheezy easy. Just easy for God to wipe them out. So why did he drag it out over 10 plagues? Why the whole event? Why the show? Why the display? Why the drama? Well, God said, so you would see my glory. So you would see my power. So that my name would be proclaimed in all the earth. In other words, God did it this way for two reasons. Really three reasons. He did it this way so that his people, the Jewish people, would see and know that he is God and that he loves them. He also did it this way so that the Egyptians would know that he is more powerful and more amazing than all their little polytheistic, false, little fake gods. And God did it this way so that the time, by the time the Israelites would get to the promised land of Canaan, there would be people there like Rahab, the harlot, who would say, hey, I have heard and I believe in the God of Israel. <laughs> in other words, church, it's all for the glory of God. It's all for the praise of his name. Why did David kill Goliath? Another quintessential moment in God's word. Well, David actually tells us before he lops Goliath's head off with the sword. In, in 1 Samuel 17, he says, this is so the whole world will know that there is a Lord in Israel. Yes. That's why it went down the way it went down. Why did God send the, the, the Israelite people into Babylonian captivity? Another long scene in God's word. I mean, why didn't God just wipe the Israelites out like he had done earlier with the flood? Because at this point in their history, they were doing all sorts of evil things. They were sacrificing their babies in Gehenna to their false gods. They were breaking every law. They were violating every command. So why Babylonian captivity? God tells us in Isaiah 48. Tell me if this sounds familiar. For the sake of my name, I'm going to defer my anger. Yeah, I could have wiped my people out. But for the sake of my name, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it from you. For my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profa profaned? My glory, God says, I will not give to another. 
In other words, what God is saying there, church, is, yeah, Israel has rebelled against me. They've sinned against me. They've done wrong, but I will be patient. Why? Because they're so cute. Because <laughs> they're so smart. He just has a thing for them. No. He says, for my name, for my glory, I will continue to work with broken, rebellious people. And incidentally, incidentally, people of faith and victory church, this is the only hope that you and I have. Our only hope that God will love us and care for us through all of our days is not because we're so great, because we're better than other people. No way. It's because God is interested in his glory. It's because God is interested in how his love is magnified as he pours his love and his blessing out on us as sinful, as selfish, as rebellious as we are. And if you know that's true, can you give God a loud clap of praise this morning? Thank you, Lord. Brother Paul, I need a thank you, God. Thank you. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) So why did Jesus come as we move to the New Testament? Well, what was the first thing the angels said about Jesus on that first Christmas night? Remember what they said? We'll sing it in a few months around Christmas. They said, glory to God in the highest. In other words, they were saying, Jesus Emmanuel, the Son of God, has come. Why? Primarily for the glory of God. Maybe some of you Christians like to use different names of God. You like to say, Jesus is my brother. Jesus is my friend. Maybe you're kind of upper level theological seminary trained and you like to drop fancy names of Jesus like Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, right? Jehovah Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You like to, to bust out these fancy names. Let me give you a name that Jesus actually calls himself in John 7, 18. He says, I'm the one who seeks the glory of him who sent me. In other words, Jesus says, do you want to know who I am? You want to know what I'm all about? I'm all about the glory of God. As we look to the cross in John 12, 27, again, it was Jesus who said, now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He says, but for this purpose, I've come to this hour. So here's my prayer. Father, glorify your name. Why did Jesus go to the cross? We know, I mean, we could do a full series of sermons on this. Romans 3.24, of course, says that we are justified by his grace as a gift to the redemption that is Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. In other words, what the word of God lays out for us, church, is the reason that Jesus went to the cross was to demonstrate the righteousness of God. It was to shine forth, to emanate the reality that God is righteous. It was definitely to be, as we just read, the propitiation for the death and the payment of all sins ever committed. But we also see here, and this is what I want you to take note of, what we see here is that the cross wasn't just about Jesus saving us. It was also about him demonstrating his glory to us. Are you with me? Because this is good. It's going somewhere. (laughs) I mean, why did God save you? Ephesians 1 says you were predestined to be adopted as sons. Why? To the praise of his glory. Are we seeing a theme throughout scripture? Three times in Ephesians 1, it'll say the reason God called us and chose us and predestined us and sealed us with his Holy Spirit was to the praise of his glory. In 1 Peter 2, it says of the church, say, that's me. Say, I'm the church. God's word says of you, you are a chosen race. You're a royal priest and a holy nation of people for God's own possession. We love that. But why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. (laughs) Why are you a Christian? Is it simply so you won't go to hell? No. It's actually primarily so that you would proclaim the excellencies of a God who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And incidentally, according to scripture, I think this is fascinating as well. The glory of God is the motivation for every moral activity. Every good thing that you do, every God honoring thing that you do is for the glory of God. First Peter chapter two says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Why? Why? that they may see your good deeds and as they observe them, here's what they're going to do. Glorify God in the day of his visitation. 
In other words, what God is saying to us is the reason we pursue morality and godliness, the reason we are obedient to God's word and to his Holy Spirit is so the world will see the beauty of the glory of God and in the end they'll praise him. The world will praise God. I mean, why should we remain sexually pure? What's the point of that? I don't know if Pastor Jeremy's this way, but 50% of the youth group sermons I heard growing up were, you know, sexual purity. Don't have sex until you're married. When you get married, don't have sex with anybody but your spouse, right? Why? Well, in youth group, we're given all sorts of reasons. At least I was. It's sin. It could cause emotional trauma. It could cause an unplanned pregnancy. It could give you an STD. And all those things are true. But they're secondary motivators. They're secondary reasons. First Corinthians chapter 6, it was Apostle Paul who said very clearly, flee immorality. Like literally run, bro. Get out of there. Leave and flee youthful lust. But why? Why? He said, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you? Don't you know that you have been bought with the price? Therefore, glorify God in your body. Church, why do you pray? Jesus was asked this question by the disciples. Lord, would you teach us to pray? What did Jesus say? He says, well, it's just this really cool, cool deal. You just talk to God and ask him for things and he'll give you things. So that's really the point. No, that's not what he said. He said, hey, if you want to pray, start by saying, Father, holy. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Start by giving God praise and glory and recognizing who he is. That's how you pray. You pray for the name of God to be revered to be treasured, to be respected, to be adored. I mean, church, why do you do anything? 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Man, I could keep on going, but I've already preached five sermons in four days. So, and I think you're starting to get the point. But God's word is replete with this language. All that we do, we do it for the glory of God. Now, maybe you're hearing all this and you're saying, okay, Pastor Tim, sun's in my eyes. Can you hurry up? Yes. <laughs> but you're thinking, no, I know how, a, I know how a, a sermon is supposed to work. You started with a thesis. You started by letting us know that you were going through life and you were looking for purpose. I told you to build your life on something and so you did. And it's all for the glory of God. That's great. But Pastor Tim, can I ask, like, why is this such great news? <laughs> like, you had one sermon to give. To us up here in, is it Auburn? Auburn, Washington. Why does this information that you're giving us this morning, why does it give my life purpose? Well, maybe I could frame it like this before we close. You see, most people, believe it or not, most people believe in God. But very few people live for the glory of God. In fact, about 10 years ago, Barna, maybe you've heard of Barna, they interviewed a whole bunch of people. And the first question they asked, and I want to get this right. They said, is God an important part of your life? So they'd walk up to people, is God an important part of your life? And the the vast majority of people answered by saying, yeah, yeah, yes, God is an important part of my life. But then the follow-up questions that they would ask these people that they were interviewing were a little bit more specific. They would say, okay, well, would you tell us what you value? What do you value in life? What are you you pursuing in life? What, What do you spend your money on? What are the things that you're spending your time on? What do you dream about? What are your dreams? What is your vision? What are you chasing? What are you, per, what are you pursuing? And Barna's research revealed that in these specific how do I prioritize my life questions, God, a reference to God, only showed up in a tiny fraction of their answers. In other words, if I can summarize that in my own words, if you ask people what is valuable to you and to your life, um, is God part of it? They'll say, yeah, God, yeah, yes, God is a part of that. But if you ask them, okay, well, tell me what you treasure. What do you value? What are you pursuing? Then suddenly God, a reference to God is no longer part of their answer. In other words, when you start to see where people spend their money and their time, when you start to hear what captures their thoughts and their imaginations, when their hopes and dreams and ambitions are revealed and laid before you far too often, God and his glory, the praise of his name is not central. His praise is not important. But listen, let me say this as clearly as I can. God isn't just someone who did something. He is everything. 
He is everything. Everything the Bible says is by him, it's for him, and it's through him. And the implications of that biblical reality is that it means that my life is more than just education, career, family, retirement, cul-de-sac, minivan, fun. It's more than just being moral along the path. Just obeying a few rules. It's more than that. It means what I think about, what I care about, what I pursue, what I prioritize, how I eat and what I eat, how I drink and what I drink, who I talk to and how I talk to them. All of it, every breath, every word, every action is to display and to emanate the glory of God. That's what it's about. So, you probably know the answer to this, but what is the chief end of man? According to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, it's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And now we know where they got that answer from, from God's word. This is why David said in Psalm 1611, you, O God, have made known to me the path, the purpose of life. He said, in your presence, this is why we beheld God all weekend, because in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, God, are pleasures forevermore. In other words, it's in God that all of our joys have been made complete and all of our happiness is found. And I want you to consider this. It's hardwired into the human story to praise things that we value. We do it. Every single one of us does it. If you hear a great song and you enjoy it, what do you do? You call your buddy, you text your friend, you forward it to him. Hey man, listen to this song. It's so good. So powerful. You're praising it. If you see a great show on Hulu, what do you do? You call up your homie and you go, hey, bro, this show was so good, man. You got to watch it. You'll be so moved by it. If you see a beautiful sunset, what do you do? You, you tell someone, hey, would you look at that? Check out that sunset, and if nobody's there to join you, what do you do? You, <laughs> just me, okay. You get your cell phone out, and you take a picture. You upload it to Instagram with the hashtag epic, hashtag Seattle sunset, hashtag Puget Sound on point. I'm trying to be like you guys, all right? I had to look at my notes for that one. But why do we do that? Christians and non-Christians alike, why do we do that? Because it's so glorious. It's so beautiful that you just can't keep it in. It's hardwired into the human story. You just can't keep these things to yourself. You must emanate and reveal the praise of his glory or the praise of its glory. We were at, at dinner last night and the Seahawks were playing in a preseason game. Remember that? The people next to it, preseason. Preseason, it doesn't even matter. And the people next to us, some guy like fumbled the ball. They're like, no! We're like, dude, re Matt was like, relax. Like, I think you literally said that loud enough where they could hear you. <laughs> and then they scored a touchdown, right? Late in the game, didn't even matter. And they're like, what are they? They're praising it. They're like so moved. And I like sports too, but I was like, dude, it's preseason. Let us enjoy our dinner, relax. But they can't help it because it's hardwired into the human story to praise things. One of our staff members recently bought um, the newest iPhone. I think it's like whatever, the iPhone 12 Pro or whatever. Way too much money. <laughs> but he's young and he's a tech guy. He's our tech director at the church. And so w when he pulled out this new iPhone in front of all of us, you know what we did? We moved in. <laughs> we wanted to behold it. We wanted to touch it. As he began to show us all the features and all the cool modern things that went with it, we went, <gasps> we praised it, right? That's who we are. That's what we're made to do. We're made to experience, to enjoy, to share, and to praise. And church, here's the point. If we have found the most valuable thing in the universe, then we would want to naturally experience it, enjoy it, share it, and ultimately praise it. And I want you to know that God has said to us, you have found it. You have found the most valuable thing in the universe. And God says, it's me. And so now I want you to come to me. I want you to enjoy me. I want you to come discover that really in my presence is fullness of joy. And then I want you to share and ultimately praise. Because when you come to know the Lord, whether you realize it or not, you have come to the fountainhead. 
You have come to the source of everything that you value. So to answer my dad's question, when you find that in him and you build your life on and around God, you're going to praise. That's why you're here this morning. You're here to praise. You aren't here on this planet just to go to school, to get a job, to get money, to be safe, to feel like you've won, to be happy, to retire, and then to die. (laughs) I got good news for you. You were made for far more than that. You were made by God, and you were made for the glory of God. And therefore, God's glory should impact every single decision that you make, what you value, what you pursue, what you eat, what you drink, what you say, what you do. Church, faith and victory church, do it all for the glory of God. Can we give God praise this morning? (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes and just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I living my life for the glory of God? Is everything I'm doing meant to reflect the praise of his glory? And if not, if there's an area of your life where that's not happening, then I would recommend right now that you give that to the Lord in an act of repentance, which means you're going to give it to God. You're going to turn and walk away from it. You're going to choose a different way. I want you to live your life. I want you to build your life upon the praise of of his glory because that's why you're here that's what life is really all about and finally as you stay in an attitude of prayer and honest reflection let me let me ask you this are you here this morning at this outside service and you have yet to make Jesus the Lord of your life you have yet to say Jesus you're in charge you're the leader you're the savior. You're the redeemer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live my life for you. If you want to make that decision for the first time, would you just raise your hand? Would you let me know that you're here today? I know we're at church. We're preaching to the choir a little bit, but there may be someone here who says, you know what? I've heard about Jesus, but he is not the Lord of my life, and I want him to be. The Bible says if you'll believe and receive, that's all it takes. The gift of faith, the gift of salvation is available to you right now, not because of anything you've done to deserve it, but because of Jesus Christ's substitutionary death on the cross. Father, we thank you that you're the fountain, the source from which every good thing flows, that you're the one who brings every blessing, every good and perfect gift in our life comes from you. We thank you that it's all by you and through you and for you. So as a result, Father, may we glorify you in all that we do and all that we say. May you be the treasure, the beauty that we seek. May you be the reason, the goal, the emanation, the revealing of all that we do, that the world will see. And in the day of your visitation, even the world will praise. We love you. (laughs) We praise you. And we say all of these things in the name of Jesus. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and I want to pray over you. A prayer of benediction, the prayer of Aaron in the Old Testament the prayer of blessing over his people. Lift your hands and receive this blessing as we close. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you, the the men and the women of faith and victory church. May he look upon you with favor and may he give you peace in an otherwise peaceless world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. If you receive that prayer blessing, would you give God praise one more time? Amen.